Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in the book of Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter number four. Now, while you're turning, you have probably heard these expressions or these little, little lines of thought in the past. So I'm saying this recognizing it, but have you ever heard someone say something like, where two or three are gathered, four or five opinions will be held in the midst of them. It's, it seems as if, if you just get a couple of people gathered together, you have already this very wide variety of deeply held opinions or beliefs. And then somebody wrote this, and, and I'm certain you've heard this before, but to dwell above with saints in love, that will indeed be glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's a different story. Okay, there, there's something about... The, the reality of people that brings us into places that we find challenging. And the Apostle Paul is about to continue on with this thought of unimaginable joy. I mean, it's this theme woven through the book of Philippians. There is no journey like the journey of the Christian walk, the, the Christian faith. And we have it. But in the midst of that, the Apostle Paul also realizes the reality of challenge. Remember, he calls us a family, a body. We are many, but still one. And in the midst of that body, isn't it interesting that at times we can come into some pretty significant divisions within the body? How many of you have ever had an argument with a family member that is a bigger argument than you've ever had with anybody outside of your family, but you still love your family. How many of you have ever had that before? How many of you had one on the way to church this morning? No, 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 don't, don't raise your hand. But isn't it interesting, sometimes we can have these colossal, I mean explosive relationships with family, and they're always gonna be family. They're people that we love, people that we will stand up for, people that we will defend, and still, people from which we oftentimes receive offense. So Paul's gonna begin this next section of scripture for us, the beginning of chapter four. And he does so with a therefore. I, I think what he's trying to connect is he has just told us, you are citizens together of heaven. You have your heavenly home established and you're gonna spend all of eternity together as one. And then he jumps into something that is one of the most beautiful statements regarding his love for the church found anywhere in the book. So let's look at the passage before us today. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we'll read down through verse number 3. Therefore, my brethren dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodia and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. The first thing that we're gonna observe in this passage today is where the Apostle Paul begins. He begins with a beautiful fellowship. There is something about being together with the family and that was what was taking place at, at Philippi. It was a body of believers. Paul refers to it in Romans, he says it this way. He said, so we being many are one. 
I know we're many individual members. He even spoke or used illustratively the different parts of the body, but we're still all one body. And the apostle starts to just detail this beautiful fellowship. And look at the terms that he uses when he's describing how how wonderful, touching, endearing this body is to him personally. He says at the beginning of this expression, he says, my brethren. Again, this puts Paul on the same standing, so don't miss this. When he says, okay, he doesn't use my children in the faith. He says, listen, my brethren, my brothers, my sisters in Christ, we're all in this together. And then he goes on and he says, my dearly beloved. The the Greek word for dearly beloved actually finds its root in agape. So the word is built on agape and it's an important word. He says, my dearly beloved. You say, well, well, how dearly beloved are we speaking? Do you remember when God the Father shows his approval to his son? He says, this is my dearly beloved. When he's talking about approval for Jesus himself, God the Father uses the expression, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God uses the term and the apostle Paul, in a sense, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, borrows the term. And he says, in the same fashion that God the Father loves God the Son, I'm just telling you, there is something in me that looks at you, the church of Philippi, as my dearly beloved. This is more than when your your mom tells two boys who are quarreling and brothers to tell your brother that you love him. Okay, sometimes when they're just into it, you tell your brother that you love him. And we get this sense of, I love you. And maybe he acknowledges that he truly does, but there's no feeling or emotion of love. This goes beyond that. This says, listen, I choose of my own volition. I love you. And I find something lovely in you. It's the kind of expression that we would use when we're performing a marriage ceremony. When we're performing a marriage ceremony, we're gonna say something like forsaking all others and keep thou only unto her so long as you both shall live. And the guy doesn't say, yeah, I guess so. The guy said, he better not say, I guess so, <laughs> So there's some sense of I willingly turn from all others. In fact, we go on in a marriage ceremony. He tells the world not only of his willingness, but of his expressed desire to turn from all others for you. He's saying, I have chosen you. There is some sense of you are my favorite. This is a strong term that Paul uses for the church at Philippi. And he's just saying, listen, I love you not just because I'm supposed to. I love you because I I want to. He goes on and he says, you're my longed for. This is the only place in the entire New Testament that this word, this expression is used. He says, you're my dearly beloved You're my brethren, my dearly beloved. You're my longed for. Just because people are members together of the family of God doesn't necessarily mean that they want to spend time together, but Paul did. He said, I I can't wait until we are again seated around a table when there is the fellowship of the body and I'm not severed from that fellowship. It's like those who are looking forward to a family member who's been away to come and sit around the table and there's this longing for that to happen. He says, you're my longed for. Obviously, joy is a common theme in the book of Philippians and Paul's not trying to replace the joy of the Lord with the joy of people. It seems as if he's simply saying, listen, church of Philippi, My life is better because of you. And I long for you. Then he he says, my dearly beloved again. He's simply repeating what he began with. It's this beautiful, even pastoral reminder of his gracious, loving, longing heart for the church. The fellowship of the saved. It's interesting that Paul had already said much of this earlier. In fact, if you just start to study the passage that that are leading all the way up to this, you get this sense that he really likes this church. In fact, he opens the pages of, of this epistle with verse number three and four. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Whenever I think of you, there's something that says, God, I love that church. I thank you for them. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy. There's something that overflows my heart because of you. 
Do you get the sense that the Apostle Paul loves this church? So why does he again reiterate that in in chapter 4 at the beginning? I I certainly understand that it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but I think Paul is trying to say, listen, don't forget ever that I love you. There is something about this beautiful fellowship that Paul's trying to weave through this conversation and even introduce the next thing he has to say with the importance of how beautiful, how longingly he looks toward this church at Philippi. So let me ask you a question. Do you receive correction and instruction differently from someone that you absolutely know loves you as opposed to someone that you have no idea if they do? Or you may even be suspect that they actually don't love you. Do you receive discipline from people differently? Do you you know, when you start to think about this, I believe a mature believer can accept correction from multiple sources, even from those that have little or no relationship from them. However, most benefit greatly in their growth steps toward Christ-likeness when those correcting them have already demonstrated not only a Christ-like pursuit of holiness, but also a Christ-like demonstration of his gentleness and his kindness. As we head into verse number two, there can be no question left in anybody's mind after verse number one that Paul deeply loves the church at Philippi. He'd established a relationship with them. They knew that he loved them. And this is in a very real sense, an invitation to instruct them. So before we move beyond this beautiful fellowship, please know that Paul does have a deep and abiding relationship with the church at Philippi. And it's because he has this deep relationship that he's actually willing to say, listen, there's something so valuable and so important. I have to take another step with you. And I'm going to call upon my relationship to bring about something that I believe is going to advance Christ's likeness in you. Listen, are there people that love you enough to have direct conversation with you? Do you know someone who cares so deeply about you that they can actually say something like, hey, listen, you know we're friends, right? They may even go to the length to which they might say, and we dare use these words oftentimes, they might go to the point where they say, hey, listen, I just want you to know, I love you. And because I love you, I want to have a conversation. Would you allow me to do so? I think that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing in verse number one. Let's go to verse number two. We see not only this beautiful fellowship, but now we see a broken relationship. Verse number two, I beseech Euodia and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, can you pause for just a moment? Now, let's, let's just imagine for a moment what this may have been like in a real live gathering of the church. For, for example, can you imagine if today we just, you know, I picked a couple people, but if today we did something like, um, now I need to speak to a couple people in the gathering today at Campus Church. And so first of all, I need to speak to Gertrude. And then Gertrude, I mean, a camera just zooms in on Gertrude and Gertrude's face is up on, the, up on the big screen. And Gertrude's sitting there and she's looking around and she sees herself and she's a little embarrassed. And then um, I need to speak to Frida. And uh, we find Frida wherever she is. And Gertrude's there and then Frida. And then they do a split screen and you can see both Gertrude and Frida. And they're kind of looking at each other. And when they kind of, you know, and you just get this incredible focus on these two and the gathering. Can you imagine what this would be like? But take it another step further. Okay, so we just called out two people. We put them on the big screen. And everybody in here knows exactly what the issue is. In fact, if you mention the first person's name, the other person's name automatically comes to mind. I would submit to you that that Paul didn't even have to finish. In fact, maybe people who are gathered in this assembly, when he said, I beseech you, Odia. And everybody said, oh, and Syntyche. Because people are well aware there is an issue between these two ladies. And by the way, everybody in the church knows exactly what it is. How does this happen between these two? 
Well, it would happen, I think, in, in a way, something like this. First, the two would not be on speaking terms. Their animosity is growing towards each other. The squabble is over, we don't know what, we just know they have a squabble. And so now they, they are enlisting their spouses. Then they would attempt to enlist others whom they could convince to be sympathetic toward their position. Then the focus of the church is twisted inward. Please don't miss this. The focus now of the church is twisted inward. And that is exactly where the enemy wants the focus of the church to be. Not on Christ, not on a world in need, not on the open doors that are before us, but rather focused inwardly on ourselves, on our differences, on making certain that our way is the way and selected as the only way. Paul mentions the names and he does this in brief. He didn't dwell on the problem, but how powerfully and direct these words were offered. So, so you know, let's just ask the question, who were these ladies? Who, who were they? Honestly, their, their names are not important. I mean, it could have been Myrtle and Gertrude. It could have been Willard and Henry. It could have been anything. What we do know is that Paul just interrupted the reading of this letter in some fairly startling ways. So we can know a few things about these ladies. The first thing that we know about them is they're saved. These are two ladies that are part of the body. They are saved. In Jude verse number four, the Bible says, for there are certain men crept in unawares. And then he goes on and he says, listen, these are not part of the family of God. They have, they have seduced others. They present themselves as if they are part of the body, but they're not. They crept in secretly and they're doing a lot of destruction. That's not Yodi and Syntyche. These two are, are, now obviously we wanna be on guard for those who are sneaking in, but that's not them. And it's not Paul's point. These ladies are part of the body as reflected in the local body of the church. They were born again into the family. They were purchased with his own blood. They passed from death to life. They sing the songs of the redeemed. They could stand and sing in the congregation, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. And they could sing that because that's exactly who they were. Paul said their names are written in the book of life. This is not an aside, this is the heart of the gospel. But if your name is not written in the book of life, it can and should be just like Yodi and Syntyche's was. Has your name ever been placed in that book? Are you certain that when the books are opened and the names are read, do you have every confidence that your name will be read in the Lamb's book of life? It can be because Christ died for sinners, just like you and me. He, he died a sinner's death because you and I are sinners, not because he was. He was buried, he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And he offers to all who will receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. And by faith, we receive that gift. Did you know that that was Yodia and Syntyche? And if it's not you, I would invite you even today to come to know Jesus Christ. Who are these ladies? Their names are written in the book. They are saved. Who else are these ladies? They're servants. I mean, I, I don't mean that they're bond slaves. I don't mean that, that that is their position. They're owned by another. I just mean that they have chosen to take on the position of a servant. Do you know the Bible says it this way? Paul speaking of them, he says, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. They labored with me. I love it that Paul does this. He, he uses this expression or these kinds of, of, of uh, words to communicate often throughout his writings, but he helps us understand that the work of the ministry is exactly that. There's labor involved. Like that means time, blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak. I'm gonna have to sacrifice this so that I can actually do this to engage in the work of the ministry. Listen, these two ladies were involved in that work. We would do well to just stand back before we start throwing stones at Yodi and Syntyche. They were working in, in, in a sense in the fields of, that are white unto harvest. They're out there saying, man, what can I do? How can I help? Paul, I'm here, sign me up. 
And sometimes we want to say, oh, yeah, those two ladies, but we're not working. Man, they, they found God. What part do you want me to play in the work? Now, sometimes that's on a Sunday. That's, that's teaching children Sunday school. It's singing in the choir. Sometimes that work is greeting people as they come to church or helping park cars or helping with ushering and a myriad of different things. Sometimes it happens on Sunday, but more often than not, I think it happens on Monday through Saturday, the work of the church. It means when you go to work, you are representing the body and it's work and you're being, you're being conscientious. There's labor involved. Hey, how am I going to advance the work that God's given me to do? And you start to labor for the work. These two were servants. They stood side by side with Paul, with other fellow laborers. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul uses the expression, the work of the ministry. Listen, if you're going to help involve or advance the work of the ministry, you're going to have to labor to do so. And these two were willing to do it. They were saved. They were servants. And you know the other that they were. They were sinners, just like you and me. They knew the reality of personal failure. Remember, at the end of chapter 3, Paul reminds us that we've been reconciled with Christ. And because of that, we're going to be reunited with Christ. Okay, so reconciled, that means everything's square and even. Price has been fully paid. I am reconciled to Christ. There's nothing that has to be added. Jesus paid it all. Someday, we're going to be reunited with Christ. Man, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Reconciled, reunited, but there's a big space in between the two. And that's what the Apostle Paul starts to address here. Sometimes we just like to, hey, I'm, I'm reconciled, wonderful. I'm reunited, amen. But what about all that's in between? And Paul starts to address that point specifically with the church and even more specifically with these two. Clearly, the issue that the apostle is about to address is not doctrinal. Paul, whenever there's a doctrinal error, he floods it with teaching. He teaches the correct doctrine and he says, reject those that are not teaching, mark them. So this is not a doctrinal matter. Do you know what else it wasn't? This is not a moral matter. Because there were times when Paul just, I mean, to read what Paul would write about some moral failure, to the church at Corinth, he says, listen, it's not right that a man should have his father's wife. And oh, you could hear gasps in the church at Corinth when this is written. This is not a moral matter because Paul didn't hesitate in the least to cover a moral matter. This is not a theological issue. Paul, Paul doesn't address any theology here. Do you know what this was? This was just a personal matter. This was something that came between these two ladies. And it could have been over something like the decorations that were used at the last church potluck. This could be a disagreement over who could sing in the choir. This could be an issue with how one was taking Sunday school and what that did to the other's children. It, it could have been one was asked to sing more frequently than the other. We really don't know. And apparently it really doesn't matter. Whatever the problem was between these two ladies, it had the potential to greatly hinder and even divide the church. It would keep the church from reaching the lost and strengthening the saved. Again, while we don't know exactly what the problem was, I would submit it was petty. Not petty to these two ladies, but petty still the same. I believe while the problem was petty, they were clearly perturbed and they both demanded to be pacified and that could only happen if their solution was the one preferred. And by the way, think of the quandary this would put the church leadership in. Here's two influential members of the church that are dividing over a non-doctrinal issue. We're not talking about salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. One of them had not sided with the Judaizers and another with the Gnostics. This is not a problem that has to do with the gifts of the spirit, the offices of the local church. Their issues had to do with some other matter of which we're not aware. And Paul says that the problem is important enough to actually call out these ladies by name. So, so now what, what, what are we supposed to do with this? Do you know the issue that this put the church leadership in? What, is the, what are the pastors there supposed to do? 
Because this is not a, necessarily a right and a wrong issue. Otherwise, I think Paul would have said, okay, hey, listen, Syntyche made some good points. Yodia, come on, I want you to come. Oh, he doesn't do that. This is just an issue between these two ladies. And so now what, is the, what are the pastors? One of them goes to one of the pastors, which may have been Clement, by the way, that's mentioned in this passage. Um, a pastor, I need to ask you a question. And, and he may say, well, I, I see your point. But, um, and then the other one comes and says, I heard you talk to Syntyche. Well, yes, I did. And well, let me just tell you, you weren't aware of what's he supposed to do? Did you know that you cannot please all the people all the time? Do you know the situation that, that, that the leaders of the church were put in? Hey, you fix it for me. Because I'm telling you, this is how it needs to be done. And Paul so wisely doesn't touch the issue in the least. He says, hey, ladies, you need to resolve this matter. We must realize that no leaders in the church are able to please every person, every member all the time. So often to please one member means to displease another. Now, if it has to do with doctrine, pleasing God is the only one that counts. But in non-doctrinal, preferential matters, it is seldom possible that everyone will be in agreement with how everything is being carried out. So Paul just wisely doesn't take sides. He just says, get it resolved before it becomes something that disrupts the unity and effectiveness of the church. When problems arise, and especially problems between influential members of the church, which I believe these two were, there's the real possibility that people will become critical, bitter, vengeful, hostile, unforgiving, and proud. Paul knew that unless decisive action was taken quickly, the Philippian church could dissolve into divisive and hostile factions. Even when the church doctrine is sound, when discord and disunity are found within, we misrepresent the unified body of Christ and we lose our effectiveness, our power, not to mention our testimony with any who are watching. So how does Paul help us and, and actually help them with this matter of resolution? Well, the first thing he does, because of this broken relationship, he says, hey, remember where your citizenship lies. Remember, you are both part of the family of God. Your citizenship, your security, it's found in Christ. And you're both complete, both of you complete in Jesus Christ. And for all of eternity, you're going to spend together forever with Christ in heaven. They were citizens of heaven. Their names are written in the book of life. We're on the same team. We're not enemies. We shouldn't look at another in the body as an enemy. Don't talk about others in your spiritual family in derogatory ways. When the church, their view becomes twisted and we become inward looking, it's so easy for us to see the differences between us and another member. And the apostle Paul says, hey, whoa, 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 back up just a little bit. Remember, you are both part of this body. You are both citizens of heaven. Your names both are written in the book of life. And then he goes on and he says, okay, remember where your citizenship lies. Then listen to those that love you. There are people that do love you. Listen to them. Twice, Paul says, he says it individually. He doesn't give this generic, I beseech you all. No, he says, I beseech you, Syntyche. I beseech you, Yodia. He's talking to them individually. And he says, please listen to those. You know I love you. You know that the church loves you. Listen to those that love you. He basically says, I'm pleading with you. I'm exhorting you. I'm desiring this of you. I'm urging you to resolve this matter. Whenever we have determined that a matter will not be resolved, then seldom, even if we get what we want, is a matter ever truly resolved. What do we have to do? We have to just back away from our deeply held uh, uh, belief about this matter. And we have to say, okay, listen, I know you care about me. So what do I need to hear? He says, remember where your citizenship lies. Listen to those that love you. And then he says, know where you must agree. Know where you must agree. 
Paul tells these ladies where their agreement must lie. And again, you see that in verse number two. He says, I beseech Yodia and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Do you know what the church seems to do when they look inward is they look at the liberty or the custom or the tradition of the church and they say, okay, now everybody has to do it exactly this way if we're going to walk together. And if you don't do it exactly this way, I may actually come after you to get you to do it this way. And the apostle Paul said, no, 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 no. You have to be of a same mind in the Lord. Know where you must agree. Being of one mind doesn't mean that we tolerate any doctrinal error. With those that hold to it, it does mean that we tolerate others' differences and stand as we are, one in the Lord. I think many times we we try to make our, our preferential positions doctrinal positions. We try to say, no, 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 I'm holding on to this for the Lord. Now, let me ask you, and let's be honest about this. Do you think that Yodia and Syntyche were both standing, defending the truths of the Lord in their own mind? I think they were. I think they, they looked at the other and they said, they are wrong and this is right. And I have the, the backing of Almighty God. But Paul says, hey, listen, you actually don't. You may presume that you do, but you have to set some things aside and you have to stand as one in the Lord. And then he just goes on and he says, okay, now make room for others to help. Now he says this to them by by implication when he says, okay, my true yoke fellow, I want you to step in. These two ladies are going to need some help. Now remember, word came to Paul by Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus takes the gift from the church at Philippi. Epaphroditus gets very sick. He finally recovers. I mean, there's been a long period of time. And then he finally goes back. This thing has been stewing and brewing for a while. And he says, okay, ladies, make some room for someone else to help. And that, that just leads us to our closing point. We do see this beautiful fellowship. We see a broken relationship. But the last thing we see is this blessed partnership. Like we get to come together and accomplish something for the good of the body. Verse number three. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. There's two partnerships that Paul's calling on here. First of all, a personal partnership. He says, my true yoke fellow. The word yoke fellow here is sudzagos, sudzagos. It's really, it's a, it is what some people, in fact, many people think that that, that is a personal name. That Paul is saying, sudzagos, I need your help with this. You are my true yoke fellow. You and I have both hitched up together under the yoke of the gospel and pulled for the advancement of the same. He's saying, hey, you're going to need to help these two. They're going to be publicly humiliated, but it had to be mentioned because of what's at stake within the body. And so, Sudzigas, my true yoke fellow, I know you love them. We've shared the same yoke. I know you love them like I love them. And I know you love the church that I so dearly, deeply love at Philippi. Sudzagas, I'm asking you, step in and help. This is a personal partnership. And the word help those women, and if you want to talk about this is a serious matter, help those women, the Greek word means to seize, to take. Do you remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane? Do you remember that? And the soldiers came. Jesus said, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? Because they'd come and now they've apprehended. Do you know what Paul says to this Sudzigas, this yoke fellow, this true yoke fellow? He says, hey, listen, you better get a hold of this situation and you need to do it right away. Get a hold of it. He says, if there's something that can actually split this church wide open, it is this little rift between Yodia and Syntyche. And he says, you got to grab a hold of it. Now, he's not saying go apprehend these ladies, but he's saying you have to go get a hold of this situation before it has the potential to tear the whole thing apart. So it is this personal partnership, and then it's a public partnership. In a sense, Paul has spent time praising these ladies by saying, they've labored with me. 
Hey, listen, they labored with all of us. They labored with Clement. Their fellow laborers. Listen, hey, hey, all of us together, church at Philippi, this is for all of us to be on guard about. Come on, let's all, we're one body in Christ. Let's help these two that are part of the body. Paul did understand, I think, that there'd be an overwhelming sense of shame connected with these two. Can you imagine how utterly humiliated they would be if, if they knew that their little squabble would be recorded in the gospel letter and would exist for all of eternity and certainly has for, for the last 2,000 years for us to see. Paul understood they're going to need some personal and, and even public help. Do you know what he's saying by this? He's saying, hey, listen, there's room in the body for those who've blown it. Can I say that once more? There's room in the body for those who've blown it, even publicly blown it. Sometimes when someone blows it, we're like, well, they're, they're done. He says, no, 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 come on, help them. Let, let's get them back to where they need to be. These ladies are valuable. They've labored with me. I know them. And so the apostle just says, hey, okay, Sudzagos, you're, you're going to have to step in here. And then all of us, this is for all of us. We, we can handle that. The body of believers is intended to absorb things that we can understand it's part of the family. And then Paul just moves on. He doesn't belabor their misconduct. Isn't that interesting? He, he gives this beautiful, hey, dearly beloved, my long for, my joy, my crown, my dearly beloved, uh, help these two ladies. Uh, Sudzigas, help them. Church, understand, make room. And then as if he's preparing to just redirect their attention. Don't dwell on this. What does he say next? Rejoice in the Lord. And then almost as if they're still thinking about the situation that he's just addressed. Again, I say, hey, hey pay attention, he's saying. I, I, I say unto you again, rejoice in the Lord. And then he moves on and he moves us away from it. This isn't the thing that they're going to dwell on forever. Let's resolve this. Let's get it taken care of. And come on, everybody. Let's, let's go. Let's think about the Lord. You and I have a real enemy who has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. We have far better things to do than to focus internally on sometimes what we might call petty differences within because there is a real enemy without. And Paul, while not naming the issue, thankfully, because we might be tempted to say, well, that's not my issue. He doesn't mention it. He says, it's just an issue. And it's not moral. It's not theological. It's not doctrinal. It's personal. So let's get it resolved so that we can go on and rejoice in the Lord. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.